Uh, uh, so to start it on the YouTube link, we'll go to Mila and click custom live changes. Yeah. Alright, so I guess I'll go do a table announcement in the building and um what is it? Was that? I don't know where that was. Um, yeah. If we share our intro slides, will that mess up too much? No, I can just reshare them together. Uh, Hello to everyone who is currently on our Zoom. Uh, we're getting ready to set up in person, so uh, we'll start in a couple of minutes, uh, but we appreciate you being here already. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and just put um, gotcha. uh, okay. So, uh, all right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending Talking Science Bubble. Tonight is our first on site um, presentation. We've been on Zoom um, throughout the pandemic, and we're happy to be back in the library. Um, we're looking forward to making this a regular thread. Uh, so, the Berkeley Public Library hosts Talking, Talking the Science Bubble once a month. Um, this is a monthly seminar series that aims to share new research findings from grad students and postdocs at UC Berkeley with the general public and create constructive discussion about a variety of science topics. We have two speakers at each seminar who will talk about their current research or a topic that they find really interesting. The organizers are four graduate students at UC Berkeley, Kaylin Zong, Daniel Brett Howard, Madison Lemer, and Oksana Ogbert. Lectures happen on the third Tuesday of the month at 5.30 p.m. These programs are live streamed on the Science Bubble YouTube page, so you can view them later and share them with others. Hopping the Science Bubble also has a website and a listserv that you can join to keep up to date on new Science Bubble lecture topics. Okay. Hi, everybody. We're happy to have some of you live with us here uh, as our first live talk back since COVID, also hybrid. So thank you to everyone on uh, on our Zoom. Um, we, as Kelsey said, are a monthly seminar series bringing research from UC Berkeley researchers to the general public in Berkeley. Uh, we're here at 5.30 p.m. the third Tuesday of every single month. 
Uh, and our talk is open format. Uh, so we really encourage if you have any questions, curiosity, clarifying, or just like something you'd like to know, uh, please feel free. We'll moderate in real time uh, and encourage you to participate. So I believe Kaylin will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Madison. Hi, everyone, and hi, everyone on the Zoom lens. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Yasmin, who is our first speaker today. Yasmin uh, was born in Jamaica and grew up in Rockville, Maryland. In 2019, she graduated from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where she received her Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Yasmin is currently a fourth year PhD student in the UCSF UC Berkeley Joint Program in Bioengineering. Her research is in the field of neuroengineering and neuroprosthetics. Specifically, she is investigating the role neural signatures have in motor function. Outside of the lab, Yasmin serves as a diversity and community fellow at UC Berkeley. She also enjoys photography, traveling, and singing. So, take it away, Hi everyone. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Kim So um, my topic for today is unlocking movement after paralysis, enhancing motor functions through brain computer interfaces. So the order of my my talk will be just a brief introduction of neurological disorders and talking about current rehabilitation systems, then doing an introduction into what brain computer interfaces are, um, and then going highlighting some of the research that's currently being done in my lab, which is the Google lab at UCSF. So neurological disorders, what are they? They are disorders that affect the central, central and peripheral nervous system. Uh, the central nervous system encompasses your brain and your spinal cord, and then your peripheral nervous system is all the nerves that move through the rest of your body. Um, and so some examples of neurological disorders are stroke, <coughs> sorry, um, which occurs when a blood vessel in the brain becomes blocked or when a blood vessel bursts. Epilepsy, which is also known as a seizure disorder, which results from having the signals um, from the neurons in your brain. Parkinson's, which is a pro progressive disease caused by nerve cell damage um, in the brain, particularly within the basal ganglia. Um, and it is marked by unintended and uncontrollable movements, um, as well as balance and coordination difficulty. And the last one that I'll introduce here um, is ALS, which is another progressive disease um, that occurs when nerve cells break down and result in weakened muscle and just lack of physical um, strength. And so these are just broadly some examples of neurological disorders. And then this figure on, on the right here just shows the parts of your body that are encompassed the central ner nervous system and then the peripheral nervous system. And so each of these neurological disorders affects various parts of your body and your well-being. Um, three that I highlight here are speech, um, which is your ability to communicate um, in terms of how well you communicate, um, as well as how, how well you enunciate and can vocalize certain words. Your motor function um, in terms of how well you can actually move your limbs and then cognition. Um, the idea of understanding and being able to produce knowledge. So for the rest of this talk, I will be talking mostly about motor function, because that's where that's being done in my lab. So general statistic, approximately 5.4 million people in the U.S. currently live with paralysis. Um, and when you look more specifically at motor disability within the U.S., uh, approximately 300,000 people in the U.S. suffer from a spinal cord injury. Um, and there are approximately 17,000 new cases each year. Some of the main causes of spinal cord injuries are car crashes, falls, some level of violence, cars, surgery, or some other um, incidents, sorry. And then what usually results is that there's either incomplete tetraplegia or complete, some level of complete or incomplete tetraplegia or paraplegia. And so what that means, tetraplegia means that you have it affects all four limbs um, in terms of, so your upper body and your lower body range of motion is severely impacted. Paraplegia just means your bottom half. Um, and then there are a few percentages that um, 
and abnormal after having some sort of spinal cord injury. And so current rehabilitation systems encompass um, occupational therapy and physical therapy. And so introduction to occupational therapy is that it focuses on improving the ability to perform tasks, activities of daily living. And that could be um, helping a stroke survivor learn how to put on their clothes again, learn how to tie their shoelaces, um, more daily activities, things that they want to do around, um, around their home, for example. The alternative or another component is physical therapy, which is more focused upon performing movements of the physical body. So that's physically moving limbs, realigning bones and joints, um, trying to reactivate any motion in those limbs. My research question is mostly focused on those who aren't able to um, improve or regain any level of control, particularly those who are tetraplegic. How can we restore motor function for them? And so this is where my field comes in, which is brain computer interfaces. And so what brain computer interface does is that it takes neural signals from the brain through an electrode that's surgically implanted. Um, it does real-time analysis where it translates those neural signals into control signals. Um, and then that allows our participant to control an external device, whether that be a computer cursor or an artificial limb. And this whole process is in a closed loop system so our participant is able to see it. So the is we record signal, translate that into controlled um, signals for the, these devices, and then it continues again in a loop. Okay. okay. And so within BCI, there are three different recording signals that you can have. The first one is EEG, which means the electrodes are placed just on the surface of your scalp. So it records through your hair, your skin, your bone, all of that. Um, the second option is an ECOG array, which is where the electrodes are placed onto the surface of the brain. Um, and then you have MEA, which is multi-electrode arrays, which are placed directly into the brain. Those are intracortical. And so they connect into the individual neurons to record the neural activity that way. So within my lab, going back, within my lab, we use the ECOB array, which means that we, our participants have had brain surgery and they have an electrode that's placed onto the surface of their brain. And so the idea now is like, how can we unlock movement for our participants who are paraplegic or tetraplegic, my apologies. And so my project um, is called BCI for Restoration of Arm. Arm function and voice, also known as the Bravo Project. Um, and so the figure on the left shows generally what our setup looks like in terms of recording neural activity. We have that grid, which has been, so on the left is a schematic of it, but then on the right, you can see the actual devices. We have a 128 channel array that is placed onto the surface of our participant's brain. And then you see this digital connector that is how we physically wire our participant into our system and record their neural activity. And so the objective of our project is to establish intuitive control of this BCI device um, using these ECOG signals. And the goal is to very much align it with our participants' goal of being able to see themselves and communicate more effectively by interacting and using these external devices. So previously, our lab has done work with um, computer computer cursors, um, but the research I'll focus on or show today is about using a robotic arm to interact with their environment. So the robotic arm that we have, it's a Canova robot arm. It has seven degrees of freedom. And the way that our participant controls, because we're using neural activity, the way that they control is through body-centric imagined movements. So the idea is, that as our participants imagines moving their, their individual limb, granted they don't have the physical capabilities to move them, um, so we just use imagined movements. As they imagine, the robot will also match that movement. So to imagine moving to the right, our participant imagines moving their right arm. To move to the left, left thumb, or left hand, move up, 
um, lips, down, tongue, and then forwards and backwards. Imagine moving the head and left leg. And all the data that we show here, our participants have gotten very used to these control systems. Um, and so it's not difficult for them to um, understand and be able to very quickly adapt. Okay, I'm trying to move to this right side. I need to do my right hand. And so this is a quick video of our control system. So currently our participant has to grab this block, pick it up, and move it to the other bin. And all of this control is being done using their neural activity. And then as a second example, so that example was about object manipulation, so picking up and moving it to another direction. This one is a similar task, but rather than picking up and moving um, in a, you know, separately, it has, he has, the participant has to pick up and move the block to one of these four coordinates. Okay, for some reason that one doesn't want to play. Okay, um, doesn't want to play, but basically he successfully is able to pick it up and move it to one of the other coordinates. And so this then goes, This that was a general introduction to the work that my lab overall is doing. Our goal is to improve robot control so that it is intuitive. So that rather than you know him necessarily having to think as much as we do, It'll be very much as simple as we do. I want to pick up a cup. I want to move it. So what my research does is diving more specifically into the different brain um, brain waves that can be retrieved from the neural activity. So brain waves are just a synchrony of your the neural activity, and once you filter it through different frequencies, you get different bands. Um, and for my research, I'm particularly interested in beta. Um, which is this central region here, which is approximately 13 to 30 hertz frequency range. So next topic is beta frequency and movement. So with our ECOG study, one thing we've noticed is that most of you look in B, when you have hand movements versus rest, is that during our, the beta frequency range, during rest, there's a peak in the beta range. And so, and then outside of that range, there isn't a peak. And so what that kind of relates to in layman's terms is that beta's behavior um, is very much characteristic in terms of in reaching grass, in reaching grass and behaviors, in that it is enhanced or increased during these hold periods. Um, and then it's attenuated or decreased during movement. And then there's a rebound post movement. So basically this is something that's inherent um, that whenever you are still, your beta is high. Whenever you try to move, it's low. And so, as I mentioned previously, the whole goal of our project is to build a system that's intuitive and that very much, as best as we can, mimics how we naturally function. And so, what I'm trying to do is understand, okay, given this characteristic that we've seen in previous papers and other studies, how can we incorporate that into our study? Do we even see those signals in our study? Um, and so, that's then what I've been looking at. So it's one of the contributions, one of the factors of our research and my project is that because we have this ECOG array, which as you saw was 128 um, channels, we can physically, well not physically, but we can spatially represent what all the neural activity is doing. And so that's what this is. This figure is showing. Um, it's showing both the beta and the high gamma, which I didn't mention previously, but um, high gamma is, has a flipped response when it comes to control. So during rest periods, it's low, and then during control, it's high. Um, and so just basically what we're seeing is that beta and high gamma have these very different representations in our map. Um, and then when we look temporally, so across time at our beta, beta sequence or beta signal and our high gamma signal, we see that during periods, um, like whole period, which is between this green and black, 
the beta is high versus during these the actual control periods, which is between the green and the red, beta is beta is low and high gamma is high. So basically what this is indicating to us is just that, um, sorry, I just had a pause, <laughs> sorry. What it's just indicating is that we are seeing the signal that even if with our paralyzed participants, we are seeing um, this very nice representation of movement, that even though they aren't physically able to move their arms and move their arms to, to um, participate in the task, the imagined movements are good enough to represent movement. Um, and so the question then is, how can we incorporate this into our system? And so what that looks like is, this is a schematic of what the control would look like. And so the idea is that if the participant is in a stage of engagement, um, which is when beta would be, sorry, engagement in terms of a state where beta would be high, um, the robot wouldn't move. And then in states where the beta is low, the robot would move. So kind of mimicking how it would naturally move, where it is that if beta is high, we're not, we're in a whole period, we're not doing anything, we're thinking about something else, versus when beta is low, we're in active control and movement. So um, yeah, that's a quick way of just introducing the research that I do in my lab. Um, two researchers that I wanted to highlight were Dr. Ricky Muller and Dr. Jennifer Collinger. Um, these are two faculty members in the bioengineering, um, neuroscience, not neuroscience and neuroengineering field. Um, Dr. Muller is at UC Berkeley, and then um, Dr. Collinger is at University of Pittsburgh. And I just want to thank my lab, um, and thank you all. Yeah. So when you're training the robots with someone, how transferable is that to another person? Or does each person have to be trained with their own like imagined movements? Yes, each person has to be trained with their own imagined movements. Um, so the structure, the infrastructure is the same. So it is in terms of, you know, the algorithms that we're using to translate their neural activity to control is the same. Um, but in terms of the weights that are being applied, they have to be initialized for each individual participant. But the way that our system is set up now, we don't need that much data to be able to do that. Just a couple of days. Um, and then we can train the date, the train the decoder to be able to very accurately move from one person to another. Yeah. And that kind of comes down to let's say to the just different how your brains are each individual person's brain is different mm -hmm. and how we imagine actions is going to be different. So as much as we try to have similarities between um, like instructions, so if I'm telling you to imagine moving your arm this way, if I tell you and I tell somebody else the same instruction, you might imagine it this way and they might imagine it this way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's each individual person has to be individually um, introduced to the system. Yes. Um, when you're playing those videos, are they in real time? Like they're not simulating that? Yeah, that's real time. Uh, so it's kind of very slow because usually when we move stuff, it's very fast. Yeah. How do you kind of, does the patient need to imagine the same movement again and again so you can recognize the signal or how does it work? Yeah, so it's a combination. So part of the, the robot itself has velocity and dynamics in the sense of if you give it a certain um, signal for a continuous amount of time, it can just coast and move by itself. Um, moving along with those dynamics. And so part of it is that, yes, our participants do have to, they're trying to move right, they do constantly say right, 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 right. Um, but there is also an added where the robot itself, depending on um, how much input is given to the robot, could also just coast if that's the direction that the participant wants to continue moving in. So then the per participant can disengage from the system and then re-engage when they want to change directions. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference in this kind of, if I want to have a robotic arm move similar like normal humans, the speed or their uh, maybe efficiency, what's the limitation that's more, uh, could, could be like preventing the ro robotic arms from moving as smoothly, as fast as? Yeah, so I would say part of it has to do with how fast we're decoding um, and how fast we're um, translating this neural activity to the robot control. Um, another thing too is that because we are removing it from as much so for our system, we capture a neural signal every 200 milliseconds. 
um, but then based upon our process in order to denoise, um, we, we it takes the second worth of data and then it does other processes that goes through the a really long pipeline. Um, so part of it is just the system that we have. So the neural decoding algorithms that we're using using. Um, so it's a matter of how well can we speed that up so that we're not losing the quality of the signal because that's something you don't want necessarily is that with this you don't want the signal to be super noisy because then the robot will just move in very odd directions um but also being able to allow the participant to be in it one alternative is that you can have add a whole bunch of assistance assistance to the project to the robot control so that is that the robot will auto center the robot will auto complete grass you know the robot once it, if the person just gives one input the robot could complete the rest of it that is one alternative and that would make it super fast and very much analogous to how we move the downside to that is then that the participant isn't very involved in that process um which could be a a, a positive because then it means that the cognitive load on them is not that high um but it's also just a you know how involved is, does a participant actually want to be in the whole system yeah um i have two questions yeah one is is the robot arm like can you just, is it designed to receive either the left or the right arm yes cool and so when the participant like moves it like do you see a difference if they imagine it to be their dominant arm versus like not dominant arm so currently that's a good question we haven't Currently, based on the FDA rules for our study, the, the robot is actually um, away from our participant. So it's probably at a table the distance of where that group ottoman is. Um, and so we kind of just currently have it in a in a position. And so we haven't really thought about or shifted the position to that, okay, if it's imagined as the dominant arm versus the non-dominant arm. Um, but I think when we've done virtual tasks where that has shifted a, a little bit, there doesn't really seem to be that much of a difference in terms of the control because it's still just go right go left go forward go backwards but yeah maybe once we we're currently trying to move the robot closer to a participant so maybe once we are able to do that we can see if there's a difference between being on the dominant or being on the dominant side and then i have a question about adding this like beta wave like when it's yeah. high it's off when it's low yeah. it's on obviously the correlation is that it's on when the gamma waves are off and yes. vice versa but this isn't completely like it's not a complete one-to-one -one, right there's clearly some overlap in when yes. they're both on do you then get delays of the robot turning on like would that increase the time to respond for your robot or is that able to be made as like a very quick decision yeah so it can be made to be a very quick decision and so what we're doing is trying to train it so that it does get both of those profiles where right? the only way it will do either of those options is if both beta is high and high gamma is low and then the flip if high gamma is high and beta is low and so in that instance it is that you're very much looking for this anti-correlated relationship um, and if you don't see that, then the robot will just continue moving as usual. And so then with the profile, it would be that, okay, because the way our system works is that we feed it both of those signals anyways. Um, and so it's, if you see this response, do this, and then it kind of just moves through the pipeline. And it can be very quick. Yeah. Uh, if I remember from one of your slides, uh, you were one of the degrees of freedom is like you move your tongue or your head to yes. move the robot arm like up or down. Or yes. Uh, to me, yeah. that feels a little awkward as a as an action to move the, the arm one direction or another. Um, would it work to code the, the arm such that like it's based on where you imagine your arms moving like left, right, up or down? Yes. So we have done that. Um, so some other. Ooh, sorry. Some other versions of doing imagined controls has been having the um, participant do more continuous actions like, okay, if I continuously move my arm this way versus this way. One of the things is that, that by doing that, it changes how we can decode. Because currently our decoding framework is based on discrete action, meaning they just constantly pulse right, 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 right. Um, when you do more of a continuous move as my arm moves, that changes our decoder. And we, when we have tried to implement that, 
Um, both the participants found it to not be as successful in control as doing this more discrete actions. Um, and so we did it to collect the data, but then have shifted back to a discrete system. Um, and so going back to your point of, you know, head and tongue might not be very natural. What our lab is, what we're trying to move towards now is finger movements, um, which might be, or <clears throat> arm movements very specifically. So it's rather than thinking tongue and head, it's okay individual finger movements, which we are able to capture and, and have the signals be distinct, which might be more intuitive um, and less weird or unusual to be like, oh, I'm thinking of moving my tongue. Um, but the initial design of these was that it was somewhat body-centric. So right hand, left hand, tongue, um, and then lips, you know, as in the front and back faces, and then head and left leg. Um, so there was some level of body-centric intuitive design towards it, but yes, we understand that it's a bit unusual for those to be the directions. I mean, are looking at other alternatives. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our next speaker will get ready. Did we have any questions on Zoom? Our second speaker tonight is Brianna, who was born and raised in Colorado, where she obtained her lifelong love of the outdoors. She obtained her PhD in biochemistry from the University of Colorado Boulder and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Berkeley. Here, she studies the unique characteristics of transposable elements selfish genetic elements capable of propagating within genomes to provide insight into harnessing these properties for gene therapy. Outside of the lab, she enjoys exploring new trails and new foods. Very excited for your talk. Take it away, Brianna. Thank you. We'll get Brianna just a moment. Yeah, yeah just one second. My computer is hating me right now. Yeah. Not nice. About it. In the meantime, um, we encourage you to look at Berkeley Public Library calendar. We're really happy to be advertising Science Bubble on our homepage right now. Um, Next week, we're going to start having a gardening series at the library. Um, the first topic is uh, Eat What You Grow. Um, next month's topic in June will be gardening for renters. And then the following month in July, it will be what's wrong with this plant? So <laughs> the natural order of things. Yeah. Right. Oh. Okay. Here we go. OK. I'm really excited to be here. This is fun to talk to the public about, you know, what we're doing. We often live in our own bubble, so it's nice to pop that and I see exactly where the name of this programming comes from. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how we as scientists like to turn to nature and see where solutions already exist and how we can steal those ideas and re-harness them um, for our own biotech technologies. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about how um, current therapies work. Brianna, sorry. Yes. On the Zoom, oh. I think you're just sharing the slides and not the presentation. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I wonder if it's like trying to mirror in my display. I think it comes to my display. You're also uh, sharing specifically this app. So when you present it, it won't 
show the projection, it will just show this slide deck. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to um, share your screen rather than the app. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, so let me stop my share. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that was great. Okay. okay. Thank you for that. All right. And it looks okay on the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. So when we think about current medicine, um, a lot of you know, current therapies are based on a treatment that has been proven to work for uh, a lot of heterogeneous population of people. Um, but the future is really going towards personalized diagnostics um, in which you can take um, an individual's genomic background um, and, you know, their different characteristics and, and how the disease is presenting and then have a different therapy uh, for different people. Um, and hopefully this would be then effective for everyone instead of you know where where most people might be seeing uh, a good effect some people are actually have really adverse effects to therapies and so one way to do that is through gene therapy um and how many of you have heard of crispr great yeah so um crispr is probably the leading uh, gene therapy tool right now and what it's really really good at is gene disruption and nucleotide correction um, and so the reason for that is it's it's really easy to uh, change a couple of nucleotides, but when you have to add an entire gene, it becomes much less effective. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One is that you have to give a big piece of homologous DNA that the cell can then sort of swap in. Um, and that actually, when you're causing that uh, double-stranded break to swap things in, that's toxic, as well as just introducing the DNA itself can be toxic. Um, and so why might we want to add entire genes? Well, there are some uh, diseases that are caused by a loss of function. Um, and so when you talk about disease, there's some that are gain of function where you may have a mutation that now gives you a pathogenic response. Um, and in some cases, you have a loss of function. So two examples of that are hemophilia. Um, so you have low levels of these clotting factors, and this results in a bleeding disorder, right? So if you could then replace or provide the, the person with a functional gene copy of these clotting factors, you could potentially um, rescue this phenotype and, uh, you know, help them clot their blood. Another example is this Stargardt disease. Um, so this is a disease of the eye. And here you're, uh, you have a defect in ABCA4. <clears throat> and what this protein is doing is cleaning up fatty material in the retina. Um, and so again, if you could get uh, a functional gene to be produced, um, then you could alleviate those symptoms. So uh, I already told you what we're sort of capable of doing right now, but what we would like uh, for the future is, is if we could find a method that did not rely on DNA introduction um, and in fact didn't produce any DNA that lives outside of your genome at any time. So there are other methods that um, can you can supplement the genome with something that sort of exists outside of your chromosomes. Um, and then also we want something that is gonna insert site specifically. So it's not inserting all over the genome because that can create its own problems, right? You want it to insert only in a place that is safe and will not cause problems with its surrounding genes. Um, but also something that will only specifically insert what we want to insert and not other messages that already exist in the cell. And so immediately what we thought of were transposable elements. Um, now, a lot of times when we're taught about um, the genome, you know, in high school and in college, a lot of that has to do with how our cells reproduce and copy that without making errors. So how we go back and fix, and it's pretty much seen as stationary. Um, but that's not actually true. There are a lot of movements that can occur within our own genomes, and transposable elements uh, are the cause of these. And so there's really two different types of transposition. One is copy and paste mechanism. And so the way that that works, I guess I'll use my 
Is it showing up? There it is. Uh, okay, so in that case, you have the loss of the transposon at one locus, and then it reappears at another site. Or you have a copy and paste where you retain the transposon at one site, but you also gain it at another. Um, and so this is really interesting because now, even in something that should be quite static, you can see things moving around. Does that make sense? Um, so now I've planned this fun game. It's not that fun, but it's kind of fun, where we can all guess what percent of the genome uh, is composed of transposable elements. So we have here a fruit fly, and I just, I don't expect you to know, so just shout out some numbers. One percent? 135, 25, 50. The correct answer for the fruit fly is about 20% of the genome is composed of transposable elements. All right, moving right along. How about our friend, the mouse? 10, 6, 50. The answer is about 40%. I only have a couple more of this, this fun game that we're all playing. Corn. Seven. Seven. Yeah. Sixty. Five. 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 Eighty oh, percent nice. of the genome in corn is from transportable elements and, and just their relics. So a lot of these are dead. I should say it's not like they're moving all of the time, but that's incredible. Um, and then I want to end on humans. What percent of our genome? Four. Four. Twenty. Sixty. 45%. So this is astronomical. It's not like it's a small percent of our genome. Um, and in fact, when you look at genomes and how they evolve, transposable elements actually play a large role in this. And like I said, most of these are dead. They're no longer moving. Some still are, though. Um, okay, so the point here is that transposons exist across all, uh, you know, different life forms. Um, and to varying extent. So corn being the one that has uh, the largest percent. And that is actually where uh, transposable elements were first discovered. And Barbara McClintock won the Nobel Prize uh, in 1983 for their discovery. And the reason that corn is actually a pretty cool model organism is that each kernel can sort of be considered an offspring. So instead of having to do it, you can do a genomic cross and then she was looking at the phenotypes of each individual corn kernel. And you can see that despite having the same parents, you get a lot of different phenotypes in all of the corn kernels. Um, and then by looking at the chromosomes, she could see that some parts were actually being cut and then moving to another part in a, in a different chromosome. Question. Yeah. So the only theory is like domesticated corn or wild this so I don't I don't actually know the answer. My guess is that this is some sort of domesticated corn that they were using in the lab, um, but I think it's true of wild corn as well. Okay, so because this is for a general audience, um, I'm going to explain how um, the transposable element that we use works. And to do that, I need to go back to the central dogma of biology, and that is that. We have in our nucleus, in our genomes, the DNA, and that gets transcribed into RNA, which is the message uh, that leaves the nucleus, goes out into the cytoplasm, and there it is translated into protein. And this is sort of the workhorse of the cell. I should also state that although this is the central dogma, there are exceptions to this left and right and center, pretty much all of it. Um, but in general, this, this is true. Um, but interestingly, the, uh, the retro element that we study has this reverse transcription activity. So it can take an RNA message, go back to the nucleus, and then reverse transcribe it to convert it back into DNA. And that'll be important in a second. So there are different types of transposons, and I'm not going to go through all the different types, but I am going to explain the mechanism of the one that we are interested in. And this is called a non-LTR retrotransposon. And so basically, this is the central dogma in the beginning. Sorry, I'm forgetting my Zoom audience. I'll try to point here. Um, so you get transcription of the RNA. So you know the transposon exists in the genome. 
you get this RNA from that DNA. It goes out and then it is translated into protein, which is this red dot here. Now, this is where it differs. The protein then binds back on its own RNA. So it finds uh, the retrotransposon encoding RNA, finds a new site in the DNA that hasn't been inserted yet. And then it will reverse transcribe that RNA in blue and make a new DNA copy in orange. Okay, so we're actually really excited about this um, for a couple of reasons. And one is that there's no DNA that exists outside of the genome. So this is looking more specifically at that final step of insertion. So after the protein in green has found the RNA in red, goes to the target site, it'll nick one strand, and then it reverse transcribes directly into the genome. Then the second strand is nicked, and then you get complete insertion. Um, and so this is exciting because you never have a double-stranded break, or it's much reduced, um, like the probability that you have both strands broken at the same time, which again is can be toxic to our cells, is much reduced. Um, and in addition, there's not this DNA floating around in your cells, which can be toxic. Um, and then again, so the left is just, there's a lot of retrotransposons and transposons. So you don't really need to know too much about it, except that there's a lot of different types. But the one that we are interested in studying is called R2. So just think about R2D2 and just take the first half of that. Now you'll all remember it forever. Um, so R2 inserts sites specifically, and this is important. So there are transposons that exist that will sort of insert willy-nilly. And because of that, as you can imagine, that could be detrimental to your cells. And so they try to shut that down. But this element has found a site that is not toxic to the host. And because of that, it maintains this high, like really good site specificity because there is no, the cell is not shutting it down because the cell can live happily with this retrotransposon inserting at its chosen site. Does that make sense? Um, so I won't go into the specifics of where it's inserting, except to say that there are multiple copies of this same sequence um, and that disruption, disruption of a few of them is, is well tolerated. Um, and then it's worth noting that this R2 element is widespread. It exists in birds, fish, insects. It does not exist in mammals. And so even though we don't have this retro element, we still have the target site that it will insert into. So this is a good thing that if we introduce R2 into our cells, it can find that target site, but it won't be competing with anything that already exists in the cell. Okay, so like I said, um, R2 is found in a bunch of different species. And the first thing I did was isolate this protein. Um, I, I didn't isolate them from these different species. I took the sequence and uh, expressed it in mammalian cells so that it would make the protein. And then I can pull that out of the, of the lysate. So I have the proteins isolated. Um, and then I basically tested them for how active they were. And I'm not gonna show you all that data. It's actually kind of it's repetitive and boring, right? What I will tell you is that after all that work, which is like three years of my life, um, we ended up, selecting the R2 element from birds. And the reason for that has to do with specificity. So uh, this is again, the insertion mechanism. And all I really wanna point out is that because this target site sequence is so specific, we can radio label one end and then watch as that DNA strand is cut and then extended. Um, and so uh, on a gel, this will show up. And so in the following gel that I'm gonna show you, longer products are at the top and as they get smaller, they, they run lower on the gel. Um, and I've cropped it so that only this product shows up. So you're only gonna see a band if it's incorporating the RNA that I give it. Okay, so like I said, the birds are very specific. Well, first let me show you what something not specific looks like. So this is the R2 protein from the silk moth. And what I'm doing is I'm giving it the three prime UTR, which is how it recognizes itself. That's part of the RNA, that's jargon. So it's the very tail end of the RNA that it's recognizing. So I give it from different species and this protein will copy all of it. You see bands everywhere. That's all you need to know. But if we look at the birds, you'll see that there are only four bands really. So it can use these four RNAs and those all happen to be from other birds. 
Okay, and those are very, uh, the sequence at the very end of that RNA is very conserved in birds. Okay, so this is great because we're saying if we use this bird protein, it's only going to copy the messages that we tag with this very specific sequence at the end of the RNA. And then I'll spend a little less time, but I've done other experiments, and I'm not going to show them, uh, that basically show that on the RNA that it's copying, you need to have some homology, which means that there's pairing between A's and T's, G's and C's, et cetera, um, to help prime the reverse transcription. So this is just another safeguard against off-target insertions. Okay, so I had this picture up at the beginning, and this is Narcissus. And the reason I did that is because these are selfish elements. And so what I'd like to do is confuse our R2 protein and have it insert something that's not itself, but that we've dressed to look like itself. I was expecting laughter with this Mr. Bean, but that's okay. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, so what we don't want it to insert is the R2 protein. We don't want to put anything in our genomes that's going to now start moving around. So we take that and, and we take the parts of the RNA at the very beginning and the very end that it normally recognizes, and we give it pieces that will it won't recognize. So this will still express the protein, but it's not going to recognize itself. And then we take basically the clothes or how we're going to disguise our new RNA, um, and we flank that onto what we call our payload. So this is what we're inserting. And in this case, it's GFP, which is just a way to make cells breathe. And then what we can do is introduce those two RNAs, one that will encode for our protein and the other that is now our payload. Um, and then we can use flow cytometry to analyze if the cells are green. Basically what that is, is you can take cells grown on a dish and you can disrupt them so they're in solution and then pass them through a really small tube one at a time. And when you shine lasers at them, it will detect how green each cell is individually. And the way that looks is like this, where every single dot is one cell. And so you have uh, size basically on one axis and how green it is along the bottom. And so here, all I'm showing is that you don't, in this box, that's where the green cells would show up. You don't really see any, if you just give the RNA that encodes for the protein or the RNA that's the payload by themselves. But when you give both of those RNAs to the same cell, now you can see that uh, our protein is incorporating that green gene into our genome and that it's turning the cells green. Um, and importantly, that reverse transcriptase activity, if we give it a protein where it can't do the reverse transcriptase, which is turning that RNA back into DNA, even though it has both of these RNAs, you no longer see green cells. Okay, and then I'm not really gonna explain this, but I just wanted to highlight that we have shown that we're getting very little off target. So it's only inserting where we want it to, which are the taller bars and not at other locations in the genome. Um, that because it's a, a site that has it's multiple copies in the genome, you can put in you know, two or more different, different genes. Um, so here we're showing that M cherry, which is a red, you can get cells to be both red and green in this top uh, quadrant. Um, and then finally, we've uh, optimized this assay mostly by someone else in the, in the lab, Jaju, where she can now get over 70% of her cells to be green uh, within 24 hours. Um, so hopefully that was clear, please. Uh, I'm really happy to answer any questions, um, but the Collins Lab has been a fun place to do the science. and. Um, I've left my email at the bottom in case we think of a question tomorrow and want to email me about it. Thank you. I guess I'm a little bit confused mm -hmm. about the fact that we're adding extra stuff. You're just saying you'd rather it be this RNA species than DNA species, but you still need to obviously add something to the cells that wasn't there before. Yeah, so um, basically when you think about therapeutics, so like the mRNA vaccines, there's been a lot of work to make RNAs that you add to the cells safe. And your, the cells, there are modifications that we can put on the RNA so that the host cell doesn't recognize them and trigger a, a, a stress response. Whereas with DNA, 
that's not the case. So if we can give ourselves RNA, which like COVID vaccines, very safe and effective, um, that there's just been more development as to how to do that safely without triggering an immune response. Yeah. So you said that DNA is floating in the body, just like constant. What are some clear, like, um, how many symptoms of knowing whether it's like how it shows up in the body that we know it's Yeah. So um, a lot of the response, like a lot of the way that we say it and where most of my knowledge comes from is setting cells in a petri dish. So as far as like oh, right. Humans, I'm not sure. I know that there have been some gene therapy trials with like uh, giving um, a certain DNA vector into cells. And there have been some cases where that works and some cases where that backfires really badly. Um, but basically you can measure um, immune responses by looking at, so like in a cell dish, looking for specific proteins that get modified or specific pathways that have, you know, basically been studied. And we can say like, oh, if if you start to see this, this signal show up, you know that your cell is under stress. And so a lot of um, initial work, is it usually goes like Petri dish and then mouse work or, or you know something else way before it goes to like patient trials. Does that answer your question a little bit or? A little bit because a part of me is like working on it. If you only know it in a Petri dish, then how can you say the mRNA is safe and effective when you can even, you know, you can't say, well, this is what happens to a human. It has to translate to what it looks like in a human, you know? Yeah, so I think that before what we're doing, yeah. we would, we're not going to be, until we can show efficacy in like a mouse model, there won't be any human trials. However, um, the RNAs that we use are modified in the same way as like, the mRNA vaccines, which have gone through this rigorous process to show that they're safe and effective. So that's not to say that this would just pass because it's encoding something different. So that would still have to go through rigorous testing before it would ever show up, you know, as a therapeutic. Um, but I think we can use the analog because it's been used before and it's been safe, but because we're using the same design that it's likely that any toxicity would not be because of the RNA itself, but maybe something else. In, in our design. Yeah, great question. Yeah. What kinds of therapeutic theories would this new method enable beyond what CRISPR? I mean, what kind of examples? Yeah, so a lot of, uh, like I said, so CRISPR is really good at making targeted deletions or uh, flipping a few bases which can cause like premature termination and you can basically get knockouts really, really easily. Or if you want to make small corrections, that's really easy to do. But it's not good at putting in larger genes because it relies on, you need to insert a large piece of DNA and then it relies on homologous recombination, which only happens during certain parts of the cell cycle. So it's just not very efficient and it's pretty toxic. Um, and so any, um, any of those loss of function diseases where you would need to um, replace a gene that's defective with one that's a working copy, basically, that's where there's a deficiency. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. This is huge. Science bubble number one in person. We're officially back. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zoom audience. <laughs>
Um, thank you to all of our Zoom participants uh, for coming out tonight. We'll be again hybrid on Zoom next month. Uh, and if you are interested in seeing more talks or hearing more about us, I, you can follow us on any of our socials or join our mailing list uh, here either through this QR code or through the bit.ly link. Um, thank you for coming out tonight and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Sorry. Bye. Um, oh, I was on